Well, I would like to welcome our distinguished panel up onto the stage to raise the points, discuss the points raised in Gideon's oration. We have Melanie Jones, former Australian star and a member of the world's oldest women's cricket club, former Australia test captain and a champion of the Mowbray Cricket Club, Ricky Ponting, fresh from a superb 162 not out today at the MCG, and Australian batsman and a product of the Sydney University Cricket Club, Ed Cowan. Come on up, guys. Ricky, before we launch into this, let's just quickly ask you, uh, 162 today, superb batting performance from those that saw it. How are you feeling? A little bit tired. <laughs> um, no, feeling good. Uh, it's been a good start of the season uh, for Tasmania and for me to get a bit, a bit of time in the middle today and a few runs under my belt against a, a good attack um, is exactly what I needed um, looking to what we've got coming up over the next couple of weeks. So. Um, yeah, we declared today at 4.39, I think, for five, and we've got Victoria 4 for 110, so, so far, so good for Tasmania. So that's where it is today. Tell us where it all began for you and your cricket club. Yeah, well, as you mentioned there, um, cricket life for me began at school. Um, you know, when I was old enough in you know, year five to play competitive cricket, um, that's where it started. So you're sort of, a, I guess, an eight or nine-year-old then. Um, that was the first time I was allowed to play competitive cricket. Um, then got into the club system at the Mowbray Cricket Club, um, playing in the school holidays in the under 13s and under 16 competitions we used to have back then. Um, my dad had played a few seasons of first uh, first grade cricket, sorry, at at, at my club. Um, had long been retired, but came back out of retirement um, to play third grade cricket with me when I was I think 11 or 12. Um, so we had a couple of seasons together in the thirds, and as I was saying to Gideon on the table a little earlier when I was sort of big, and, big enough and strong enough, or he thought anyway, to handle myself and move up and play A grade cricket, Dad sort of walked away from cricket then and um, yeah, left me to my own devices. So I was playing um, A grade cricket at the age of 14 at the Maybrook Cricket Club. And you know, as Gideon mentioned, you know, my, my club um, was survived on volunteers. Um, we're a very working class club that um, basically was run and operated on how much money we took over the bar during a Saturday afternoon and um, you know there are a few people at the club that when you, you know, left your, your five or they put their two dollars in to, to get a beer out of the fridge they take five dollars out and all that sort of stuff um, <laughs> so yeah we've we've done things pretty tough at my club I mean I, you know, I'm very proud of my upbringing and where I came from as far as you know my whole life and, and certainly as far as cricket's concerned but um, for those that don't know when I first come onto the first class scene um, down in Tassie I had a few local sponsors and one of them was a bakery down in in Launceston and I did a TV commercial for the bakery for a certain amount of money um, we then as a club I donated all the money to the club we went out and bought all the uh, materials that we needed and actually built our club rooms um, so that was where it sort of all began and you know, to this day, my club still doesn't have turf training, training wickets. We, we train on AstroTurf and we get by that way. But, um, you know, the, the way that um, I learnt the game was from all the older guys around my club. And, you know, I remember as a nine and ten year old boy getting on my BMX and riding all over northern Tasmania to find where the Maybrook Cricket Club was playing. And I was always the first there and I'd be sitting in the change rooms when the, when the boys got there. And... When they went out onto the field, I'd be going through their bags and picking their bats up and putting their gloves on and making sure I put them back in exactly the same position again so they didn't know. And um, Come off at lunch and I'd be sitting in the corner waiting for the boys to come in and then after play, um, just sitting around and listening to the stories that they were telling about the day's cricket. And you know, that's where I learnt the game. I learnt from um, my club mates and older guys that um, you know, had been through many on-field battles. And um, you know, from listening and watching and... And therefore learning, I think a lot of what I learnt then is part of what I am now as a cricketer. Excellent stuff, Ricky. That is just amazing, isn't it, to hear someone as humble as Ricky talking about his grassroots beginnings. Mel, I want to ask you about female participation in the game. It's uh, definitely up and females now make up 17% of participants in the game. You coming from the, the world's oldest uh, women's cricket club, that's quite a claim to fame. Yeah, it certainly is and I think you know, listening to Ricky's story, I think I've heard that a lot from the male side of things. Um, for a female starting to get into the game, it was, it was completely different mm. a few years back. I won't say how many years back. Um, but when I first started, my, my father's West Indian, my mum's Australian. So I sort of obviously had a bit of 
cricketing background um, and I always wanted to play the game. And when I got to primary school, my goal was to um, kick Alan Border out of the middle order of the Australian men's cricket team. So I, I thought to myself the best way of doing that was to get into a, a cricket side and that was my primary school team. Um, and I went along and I tried out and um, unfortunately didn't make the side but made the boys second 11 team. And um, I went home that night and I said to my mum, oh mum, you know, I've, I've made the sports team and my mum's a very proud mother and she said, oh that's wonderful dear. And I said, oh, I'm playing cricket. And the look she gave me would have <laughs> put me six feet under, I think. She said, look, there's no way known a, a daughter of mine's going to play cricket. Um, it's, it's just not for girls. Uh, you're going to play netball or nothing at all. And we had this battle for weeks and weeks until I told her I was playing netball and I, I'd take my friend's dirty, stinky netball outfit home every Friday afternoon and say, oh, you know, Middle Park Primary School 1, 32 to 24. And she was happy for, for a whole term and I was happy because I, <laughs> I was playing cricket. And this, this went on for a long time and my mum was a primary school teacher at a local primary school until uh, the sports teacher came home that afternoon, afternoon to Knott Street Primary School and said, oh, Middle Park Primary School, great cricket team. And they kept trying to tell me the opening black bowler was a boy. And in Middle Park around those times, there wasn't a lot of black kids floating around, so Mum knew <laughs> that that was me and I was enrolled in Little Athletics for quite a few years. So it actually took me a long time to actually get into the sport, and that's probably one of the biggest differences now for, for young girls getting into cricket, is that they can get into it at a, at a primary school level and there, there's opportunities for them straight up to, to get involved in the game, which is certainly a credit to the state associations and, and the development of the game. What do you think has made the attitude change come about? I think it's probably uh, just a general societal change as well, um, thankfully. Um, and as we've come through, I think women have always been involved in the sport and in the game of cricket. Um, often it's, you know, whether or not it's been the scoring or the canteen, those sides of things. But when you go to a test match, and I've, I've been one of those people always going to test match cricket, you, you see a, a you know, wide spectrum of females being involved in the game. And um, one of the beautiful things about, I suppose, sport is that as we, as we grow along, especially within the school system now, is that there's more and more opportunities there and there's more and more probably stronger women out there um, pushing, pushing along and, um, you know, pushing the boundaries. Ed, you still keep tabs on your former club? Uh, yeah, I do, well and truly. I think every Saturday I, I fire through a text to see how the, the uni guys went in Sydney. I, in a little bit of a strange situation, I, I still feel a part of that club, even though uh, my club in, in Tasmania is the Glenorchy Cricket Club. I, I probably feel more affection for the Sydney Uni Cricket Club uh, than my club in Tasmania. And to be fair, when I was playing cricket for New South Wales, I probably felt more affection for the Sydney University Cricket Club than I did playing for cricket, cricket for New South Wales as well. So that, that had a big uh, role in, in my life and, and upbringing. Um, it was a bit of a strange situation. I was a 15-year-old um, who moved to play at Sydney Uni because my brother went to uni and I wanted to play cricket with my brother. Uh, but there weren't many 15-year-olds, as you can imagine, at a university cricket club. So I, I, I grew up pretty quickly. Um, learned the ways of the world um, more so than, than I would have otherwise. Uh, but it, it afforded me opportunity that I probably otherwise wouldn't have had when I'd ended up going to the same university. I, I got to live on campus and, and study the course that I wanted to study. And at the time when I, when I went to Sydney Uni, it was a, a really struggling, uh, it was cricket club in, in the competition though. There was talks of mergers, there was talks of being kicked out of the competition. Um, and, and at that point in time, it was a very amateur club being run essentially by undergraduates. So um, some very good people behind the club um, got the club moving forward and, and it's done a, a full circle, well not a full circle, a, a half circle in a sense. Uh, it's probably now the, the preeminent cricket club in Sydney. Um, has, has a very effective management and, and some great players are coming out of that club. Um, you know, I think for, for 50 years they didn't produce a first class cricket and all of a sudden they've had five or six in the last five years. So. Um, I guess it shows what a, what a cricket club can do wh when it gets its act together. Gideon, the three champions on stage at the moment talk with great passion and genuine mm. passion about their clubs. It's probably something people at home that, that watch cricket mm. maybe wouldn't realise just how important it is to these guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it seems that Ed talks about uh, the club sort of pulling themselves together. We actually haven't managed to do that at the Aris, we're, um, 
We've, uh, I think we've had two first-class players um, at our club in, the, in its indeterminate history, which we're not quite sure of. One was Don Blackie, um, who I think one of the oldest men to ever play for Australia. I think he played for Australia when he was 49 years old. So he's a kind of an inspiration to those of us who aren't quite yet 49. The door is not yet closed. And uh, the other one was um, John Strawberry Power. Some of you might remember John Strawberry Power. He, um, he opened the bowling for Victoria in the 1950s. He's famous for the fact that he used to mark the end of his run with his false teeth. <laughs> so uh, there's two great luminaries. And it, our, cl our club is still kind of in tune with, with, the, with, that kind of, with that kind of ethos. But it is interesting when you get players together, even players of, of such distinction as, as, as Ed and Ricky and, and, and Melanie, how common the stories are, how similar they are, how, how frequently recurring certain character types are and certain sort of cultural themes are. I wrote a book about my club uh, 10 years ago uh, called The Vincibles. Um, yes, The Vincibles. Uh, and I, I've had correspondence from all over the world about that book um, saying, your club reminds me of my club. Um, it's uncanny the way that you've managed to capture all the people within my club. And I said, well, they're our people. You can't have them. They're ours. Uh, we, have, we have a wonderful set of characters uh, at our club, but I'm sure that you know, my club is no more special than anybody else's. It just so happens to be mine. Ricky, I want to hear about some of the jobs that you've done over the years, particularly in your younger years, to, to volunteer for your club. I'm sure there was some scoreboard duties or something like that at one stage. Yeah, well, well yeah, I actually was playing at a very young age, but I, I used to work in the, and run and operate the scoreboard at the NTCA ground when the state games were on there. Um, and once again, I was always the first one there and I'd be in the, the change rooms before the state boys turned up and I'd be checking out what sort of gear they used before they got there as well. <laughs> um, but I think we used to get we used to get about twenty dollars a day I think to run the big scoreboard at the NTCA ground and um, but I would have done it for nothing you know it was just to be there and, and watch that level of cricket be lucky enough maybe to to you know to meet some of the players or whatever but um, yeah, so that was what I did at an early age but as I said with the you know the building of the club rooms and the laying of the of the the practice nets and all that sort of stuff um, you know we just had great people around the club that were there and giving up their weekends wholly and solely to make sure that younger people like me had an opportunity to to be, you know, maybe be a better cricketer one day or have the chance to, to play 100 club games and win a premiership for your club or, you know, luck, maybe luckily enough to go on and play cricket for, for Tasmania and maybe Australia. And, um, you know, the people I had around me at a very young age have definitely moulded me as a person and a cricketer and... Um, you know, if there's been a regret in my life is the fact that I haven't had a chance to be around that club more. Um, you know, the, the way that my life's been with, you know, being a, as Gideon said, a professional cricketer at the age of 17 and, and be on the road and away from home for most of that period of time, you just don't get as much time back around your clubs as, as we would like. And I know that's a, th a big thing that's been spoken about, you know, the last 12 months since the Argus Review about international players being back in their states and playing more but what that does is hopefully mean you can get back to your clubs more and be involved with the younger generation of people and and you know cricket and young cricketers need their heroes they need to be able to see their heroes and you know it'd be great if I could spend more time around my club or spend more time around primary schools promoting the game and just you know giving these young kids something to aspire to in the flesh so you know that's you know, I've always been passionate about that and you know the when, once my life starts to wind down a little bit as far as cricket is concerned, then I'll make sure that I am doing that because I actually feel that's a role of mine. I was lucky to be given scholarships at a young age. I went to the Cricket Academy as a 15-year-old you know, and you know, I want to make sure or do the best that I can to make sure every other young Australian out there is given the same opportunities as me. So if that means, that it means me going to a school or hosting a clinic or whatever just to get a few more people interested in the game of cricket, then that's what I'll do when the game's over. I would say that uh, I think that one of the most notable things about Ricky and about the best Australian players is that they might be professionals, but they have always approached the game with an amateur spirit, uh, an idea of playing the game before they, because they love it rather than necessarily because they get paid for it. And I think you know, Ricky's probably earned enough money financially. Uh, he's financially secure enough not to be playing the game, but he plays it because 
he still gets a real kick out of it. You only need to watch Ricky train um, for Australia to do him, see him what, doing the, um, the warm-ups every day b before a day's play to see a player who's still motivated by the, by the joy of, um, of, of cricket. Uh, and that's something that when you have players like that in a side, it's, it's contagious. It's why Ricky's been such an inspiring cricketer to, uh, to a generation of Australian players. James Sutherland, I'd like to throw a question to you. You've just spent the winter talking with 2,000 uh, club cricket leaders. We'd like to know what they told you about the future of club cricket. Uh, thanks, Sarah. They told us uh, plenty of things. Firstly, Gideon, that was a wonderful oration. Thank you. And a great tribute to club cricket. It certainly struck a chord with me, as it, uh, I'm sure, struck a chord with everyone in the room and the role that clubs play in um, Australian society, sporting clubs, and uh, in this particular case, of course, cricket clubs. Um, we, I think that uh, from, from our perspective, I guess, as the paid administrators at uh, Cricket Australia and state and territory cricket associations, I think we're very conscious and I'm very confident that uh, we understand and really believe that the, the nexus between us and the cricket community is indeed our cricket clubs. And that's really the reason behind uh, what we've done over the course of this winter with the, with the Australian Cricket Roadshow that Wally just referred to. Uh, we learned a lot of things, um, some really good things. Certainly there's a, there's a heap of passion out there for the game in clubland. Um, and I guess without labouring it too much, Sarah, the things that we heard um, really come back to... Uh, in fact, I was really surprised to hear the, the positive attitude to changing game formats. Um, a lot of the issues are to do with uh, changing uh, needs and demands on families and Australian society today. And I think that it, as well as making the game more popular and more in demand for kids, we need to make the game of cricket more popular for parents because parents actually make decisions about what sports their kids play. And that's one of the great challenges for us. And so changing game formats and making the game, I guess, more attractive to kids and parents and, and, and I guess bringing that nexus through kids playing at school through to clubs is going to really strengthen our club environment. The other thing is about accessibility, the cost of cricket, making it accessible in that front and, and on that front and improving the facilities at cricket clubs is important. And the other one is, um, which has been touched on a couple of times, but certainly by Gideon, I think Wally touched on it as well, is, is inclusion. Inclusion in a sense of making cricket a sport for all Australians. To be Australia's favourite sport, we have to be that. And that means it can't just be a sport for Anglo, Anglo males who have really dominated the cricket landscape for so long. It needs to be there for all Australians. And on top of that, it needs to be a place that families really feel comfortable. So we need to have, we need our cricket clubs to be a place where women feel very comfortable and families are very comfortable to, to do that. And that's all part of the inclusion. I think if we can work on those things, and, and, and put those actions in place, cricket, will, cricket clubs will be as strong, if not stronger, than they've ever been. Uh, and that's a great thing for us to aim for. And uh, we won't take our eye off the ball there. Thanks, Sarah. Ed, another one to you. Every time you play for Australia, do you get a sense that you're playing for your mates at your club? I mean, I'm sure they're texting, calling, wishing you well before the match. And when you run out there, you really are representing them. I think, uh, I guess it's like any uh, little community that you have existed in, whether it's your, your school community or your cricket club community or family or friends, whatever it is, I th I, you do get a sense that you, you're not just representing yourself. I was lucky enough uh, when, when the Boxing Day test was on last year, quite a few of the Sydney University cricketers uh, flew down, also coincided with the Bucks party. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they were there for for most of the first day until they, they got ejected. Um, <laughs> so it, it was nice to have them there um, because they had been right through from the time that I was uh, 20 years old and, and battling away in club cricket uh, to you know the 10-year journey, so to speak, uh, seeing that progress, the ups and downs, and, and then finally to, to reach that goal that uh, for so long you have really dreamed about. Um, so in a sense, I guess you do. Mel, what's unique about a women's cricket club? Um, well, the one thing that isn't unique, and excuse me, but um, dickheads aren't limited to men's cricket, so <laughs> we do have a couple of those. Um, 
I guess, um, I guess for my club, which is the Essendon Maribyrnong Women's Cricket Club, we are the oldest women's cricket club in the world at 108 years now. Um, and I suppose the unique part about it is that, well, the obvious is that we are all females, but um, it's a completely different setup in terms of going through to play for Australia because as much as most Australian female cricketers would like to play more and more international games, the beauty of it is is that we spend 90% of our time in clubland. And so when you speak to most of the girls, they have you know, some of the strongest connections to club cricket. And it, it is really like a family. So we really know our club people and members probably more so than what these guys would know, the, the men that they've played most of, their, most of their cricket with. So, you know, last weekend as I, <coughs> last, what was it, Friday night, as I put the Hessian and covers down solely, um, <laughs> while all the young kids did something else around there, it, it, that's all the same sort of thing. You know, you, you go through the covers, you go through the fact that your club rooms at the moment is rat infested and you try and clean the barbecue so you can have a barbecue, you know, reasonably cleanly and all those sorts of things. So all those sorts of things are exactly the same. Um, you know, we sometimes, well, not anymore, we used to wear clots, so we'd get bad wedgies. You know, they'd be something a little bit different <laughs> to what the, the guys were used to doing, but over and above all, it is, it is pretty much the, the same, same kind of community. Ricky, your face then was priceless. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I ask a question of Mel? Uh, a lot of cricket clubs uh, periodically say, you know, it'd be really good if we could get the women involved. You know, get the girls down to the club. Do you, at women's clubs, do you say, it'd be really good if we could get the men involved? <laughs> you know, get them down here? Yeah, look, I mean, we've, um, we've solo been a women's club for the entire history, and I think that's, in a way, it's been one of the reasons why we actually have been so strong and lasted so long. Um, but at the same point in time, we're having conversations now with the Essendon Men's Cricket Club. And um, look, it, times are changing. I know half our girls at our cricket club would love to be with the Essendon Men's Cricket Club and not just to play on Windy Hill, you know. <laughs> it's, it's for a variety of totally different re you know, reasons. Um, and, and we take that on board and it's one of those things that I think if, if there's the right fit there, which I think there certainly is at the moment, that we'll certainly go down that path. Ricky, what do you see as being the greatest challenge for cricket clubs in Australia? Um, I don't really know, to tell the truth. I think with some of the things that have been mentioned today, it's, it's you know, cricket seems to be able to attract the really young kids. Um, when they sort of get to 16, 17, 18 is where it seems like we're losing most of our, our club cricketers. Um, is it a time thing? I'm not sure. Um, would they rather play footy that lasts two hours on a Saturday than commit, you know, all day Saturday and Sunday for cricket? You know, I, I'm not really sure, but... There was a great initiative that Cricket Australia started last year for us, you know, Australian players, international players, where we actually had to get on the phone and ring some volunteers at cricket clubs around Australia and just say hi. Um, and I was lucky enough to draw out one from my cricket club back home, from Mabra Cricket Club, and I rang her and she believed that it was me, but the four or five other guys that I rang <laughs> thought that their mates had set, me, set them up on a prank and they were, you know, 30 seconds into the conversation saying, oh, mate, look, I'm busy, I've got some work to do, I've got to go now, so... <laughs> I'm not sure how it went down or what the feedback was like back to Cricket Australia, but I thought it was fantastic, one, to be recogni recognising the volunteers that make our club survive, but, um, you know, and I'm sure James has got, you know, right to the bottom now of what the great challenges are um, for club cricket around Australia. Um, and I think I probably touched on one as well, probably, you know, having the international players and state players back around the clubs a bit more, I think, does a, a tremendous job just to live and everything up around the club. I mean, I know the, the last club game I played um, would have been probably 10 years ago. And, you know, my situation is probably different than most. I live in Sydney now and have been away from, you know, Launceston for a long time. But um, one of the initiatives back then was it was called Back to Club Cricket Weekend, where there was a weekend in the schedule picked out where all the international players were available and they went back to their clubs and, you know, created a bit of hype around club cricket. Um, unfortunately, the weekend that was picked out um, for everywhere else in Australia, I mean, club cricket had started, but in Tasmania, club cricket hadn't started yet. So we'd organised for the state squad to play a 2020 game against the Mowbray Cricket Club. Um, the state side beat us by one run, but without a word of a lie, we would have had 5,000 people at the ground that day, you know, and kids from all over the place and all around the north of the state coming to watch the Mowbray Cricket Club play against the state squad. And I, I just remember that day thinking, you know, how great that was to have... Basically, the whole of the north, north, um, or northern Tasmania, sorry, kids, older people, parents, come up and, and watch a, turn up and watch a, a game of club cricket. It was fantastic. Ed, do you feel a similar responsibility as an Australian player to, to give something back? 
Oh, without a doubt. I, I think uh, when you ask the question to Ricky, what the greatest challenge is, uh, the thing that immediately struck to my mind was to make sure that club cricket is still the most important pathway to first class cricket in the pyramid. I think we've been really, uh, well, there has been a tendency to to maybe veer away from that and, and look at, you know, youth carnivals and, and these kind of things. But I, I think a strong club competition uh, where uh, young players can play with men and, and learn the game and learn about the game and learn about themselves. Uh, I think that's the most important thing for Australian cricket because I've seen uh, people come into state squads who haven't done, particularly in, in Tasmania, who haven't done particularly well in club cricket uh, because they've done well in youth cricket and, and they they haven't quite understood the game or, or really how to succeed at the game. And I think club cricket gives people... Um, that base because you know if you've succeeded at club cricket uh, that you're ready for first class cricket. Um, I think that's the biggest challenge to make sure that that is the most important pathway. Well ladies and gentlemen please put your hands together for our wonderful panel. <laughs> the future of cricket certainly in excellent hands with these guys custodians of the game.